Y chromosome, Adam revisited. Some of you may remember that we talked about Y chromosome, Adam a while ago, and uh, the, uh, in particular, um, uh, we also discussed the major differences between chimpanzees and human Y chromosomes that were not evident on first pass because people accepted uh, what looked good instead of what was accurate. And uh, this time we're going to be discussing an article that was found in, in icr.org. It's a, uh, it says, Why Chromosome Study Confirms a Genesis Flood Timelines. It's by Jeffrey Tompkins, PhD, uh, who worked at uh, Clemson University for some time as a uh, geneticist, and so does know his stuff pretty well. And he's going to be commenting on another article that we're going to, this, this uh, review just came out in the 17th, so this is pretty fresh. Uh, the review begins, based on biblical chronologies, we can determine that the global flood recorded in Genesis occurred about 4,500 years ago. That's a standard Masoretic text, uh, Septuagint would be 5,500. Uh, a more conservative, uh, in some ways, uh, reading of the Genesis text might be 4,300, but it's in that range. After the flood, the earth was repopulated by Noah's three sons and their wives. So we should find genetic signatures of this timeline in human DNA. While a number of previous studies by both secular and creation scientists have supported this general timeline, a recent study used, using extensive new available high quality DNA sequence data for the human Y chromosome spectacularly confirms the earlier research and solidifies the Bible's history of modern human origins. When the chronologies and genealogies of the Bible are analyzed, humans were created about 6,000 years ago as one original ancestral couple, Adam and Eve. However, the human genome went through a genetic bottleneck about 4,500 years ago when only the DNA from Noah's three sons and their wives was used to repopulate the earth. This bottleneck must also be taken into account when analyzing DNA. These Bible-based dates conflict with evolutionary speculation that claims modern humans did not arise until about 100 to 200,000 years ago from ancestors migrating out of Africa. To help resolve the controversy, two scientists, one a molecular biologist and the other a statistician, downloaded newly available DNA sequence for the Y chromosome that was more comprehensive and covered more, much longer contiguous DNA regions that had not existed previously. The Y chromosome is particularly useful in studying human pedigrees and mutations because it has no chromosomal counterpart in the human genome with which to exchange genetic information in a process called recombination, except for a little tiny piece that we can ignore. When Sperm and egg cells are formed in a person. The 22 chromosome pairs, one derived from the father and one from the mother, will exchange DNA segments with each other. Because this does not occur with the Y chromosome, it is more genetically stable and thus very useful in genetic clock studies. In this current study, the authors note that if humans had actually been around for several hundred thousand years or more, they should have accumulated eight to 59 times the amount of mutations that we currently observe in Y chromosome DNA sequence. However, the researchers in this current study empirically demonstrate that we only observe about 4,500 years of mutation accumulation in the paternal ancestry contained in the record of the human Y chromosome. In regards to the significance of these new results, the lead scientist in the study, Nathaniel Jensen, stated in an interview with ICR staff the study now adds an independent line of evidence to the genetic case for young earth creation. Previous studies looking at DNA inherited through females reflected the recent origin of humanity at creation and then through Noah's sons' wives at the flood. This new study now shows that DNA inherited through males reflects the same time scale. In summarizing the huge challenge that this new study presents to the secular community, science community, Jensen stated, I'm anxious to see how evolutionists try to dismiss this second independent line of genetic evidence for the young earth timescale. 
not only do they have to explain why the data contradict evolution, they have to also explain why the data are in such a tight match with the predictions of biblical creation. And they have to do it for both, both for DNA inherited through females and now also for DNA inherited through males. Indeed, these new results are not only a sound dismissal of evolutionary speculation, but a huge confirmation for the recent origins of mankind as revealed in the literal history of the Bible given in Genesis. Well, that's a pretty impressive uh, uh, blurb. Um, let's look at the actual data as close as we can. Um, the paper is uh, by uh, Jensen and Holland and uh, is interestingly in Answers Research Journal. Uh, what you're seeing there is, uh, you may not realize it, but it's actually a miracle. There was a time when uh, creationist organizations were, to a certain extent, at each other's throat. Um, Answers Research Journal is put out by Answers in Genesis. That blurb was by somebody from the in Institute for Creation Research. And uh, uh, what you're seeing is uh, not just civility, but cooperation between the two, which is pretty remarkable. And, of course, you can get this on the internet. The abstract of the article is, pedigree-based mutation rates act as an independent test of the young Earth creation and evolutionary timescales. Currently, evolutionists use published Y-chromosome pedigree-based mutation rates to argue for an ancient origin of humanity. Actually, it's less ancient than, than what they originally wanted, but whatever. However, their published studies rely on low-coverage sequence runs. We're going to go in into that a little bit. We show that pedigree-based mutation rates from high-coverage sequence runs, which means they're more accurate, um, are hidden in the evolutionary literature, and we demonstrate that these rates confirm a 4,500-year history for human paternal ancestry. So that's the, what they want you to come away with. Okay. Introduction on the time scale of human origins, the young Earth creation and evolutionary models contrast by orders of magnitude. According to scripture, the first humans, Adam and Eve, lived only about 6,000 years ago. Again, maybe 7,500, but certainly in that general range. Uh, current evolutionary thought puts the origin of modern Homo sapiens upwards of 200,000 to 300,000 years ago. Scientifically, this difference in orders of magnitude should be easily resolvable in multiple scientific fields, especially in the field of human genetics. Historically, the genetic time scale of human origins has been dominated by circular evolutionary arguments. In theory, to calculate the time scale of human origins, investigators must employ a version of the equation D equals RT, where D represents genetic differences, R represents the mutation rate, and T represents the time of origin. If that makes sense, um, basically, the number of mutations that you actually get is a function of how much time you've had and how, many, how fast the mutation rate goes. However, in decades past, biologists have had data only for D in this equation. And so you plug in the time and you get the rate. Nonetheless, absent an empirical measurement of human mutation rates, Evolutionists calculated R by dividing known human genetic diversity into the evolutionary geology-based time of origin of Homo sapiens and referred to the result as the molecular clock. Obviously, this method derives values for R by first assuming a model-specific value for T, which represents a circular argument, if the goal is, of the argument is to empirically determine a value for T. You'd really like to know what R is. Once you got R, then you can uh, divide D by R and you get T. False starts aside, in the last few decades, pedigree-based mutation rates have provided an independent test of the young Earth creationist and evolutionary timescales, a, te a test free of circular evolutionary assumptions, if you can measure it. 
Specifically, pedigree-based human mutation rates have directly tested the time scale of human origins in the realm of human mitochondrial DNA differences. For example, multiple studies over the last two decades have revealed an average mitochondrial DNA. Now, this is not the Y chromosome. This is the other one. Um, <coughs> that explain global human um, uh, mitochondrial DNA differences within 6,000 years. And there's some references that Jensen has to his own work. And uh, makes for interesting reading if you have the time. Autosomal differences. And I'm not going to read everything, so if you see green ellipses, those are mine. Uh, a direct molecular clock comparison is not possible for most nuclear D DNA differences. At present, molecular clock analysis of rare human autosomal differences test and appear to fit both young Earth creationism and evolution. Because we don't have a good rate for them, you can put whatever rate you need. Um, <coughs> so they could fit either way. So autosomes are not helpful. The one human genetic compartment that has not received as much attention by all sides in the origins debate is the Y chromosome. A single Y chromosome would have been present at creation. Consequently, unless God created Adam's gametes with Y chromosome differences, which uh, seems unlikely, all modern Y chromosome differences would be the result of mutations since mankind's origin. In fact, it gets tighter than that, which we'll discuss later. Uh, conversely, evolutionary expectations are also easy to derive. Because evolutionists explain all genetic differences ultimately by mutation, they also explain all Y chromosome differences by mutation. Thus, in theory, the Y chromosome differences in mutation rates could represent another direct test of the young Earth creationist and evolutionary timescales. Today, two published studies explicitly attempt to obtain the pedigree-based per-generation mutation rate for the Y chromosome, Helgeson and Tsui et al. Both studies have reported results to be consistent with the evolutionary time scale. I want you to pay attention to those two names because you're going to run into them later. So these are the two published studies that, uh, that try to find a rate. Taken at face value, these Y chromosome results together with mitochondrial DNA results create a scientific dilemma for both the young Earth creation and evolutionary models. On the one hand, the mitochondrial DNA pe pedigree-based mutation rates are consistent with the young Earth creationist model. In other words, uh, why, uh, mitochondrial Eve fits really pretty well with the young Earth creationism. On the other hand, the Y chromosome rates would seem to be consistent with the evolutionary model. Thus, each origins model must explain the contrary data in one genetic department without compromising the supporting data in the other genetic department. So what do you want to believe, mitochondrial Eve or Y chromosome Adam? A recent observation suggests a path forward. Among evolutionists, it is well known that low coverage sequencing misses many real Y chromosome differences. What is what low coverage se sequencing? When they do sequencing, they take the DNA and they make multiple copies that are relatively short. But, and then they fit them all together eventually. Um, if you have low coverage, well, you may wind up missing some of the uh, DNA. Uh, if you have high coverage, you're going to pick up more DNA differences. That means more, more copies which are overlapping better. Um, they discovered that missing DNA variants are found through the Y chromosome tree. From supplementary figure one of Posnick et al. in 2016, around 36, that is 19 plus 17, Y chromosome variants were missing in nearly all samples examined. So you can miss those if you, if you don't have really high coverage. Uh, since these variants are found in nearly all samples, they would occupy, by definition, the deep branches on the Y chromosome tree. Conversely, on average, about 23 chromosome singleton variants per individual. Uh, to give you some ex uh, idea of that, remember that uh, there are 120 more or less mutations per person 
Um, which means that 23 of those 120 are in the Y chromosome, more or less. We're missing in low coverage sequences. Again, by definition, singletons are variants at the tips of the Y chromosome tree. These missing variants at the tips of the tree have the most relevance to our question of pedigree-based mutation rate studies. By definition, comparisons of living fathers and sons represent the most recent time points on the Y chromosome tree, the tips of the tree. Therefore, low coverage studies would, most, would likely miss several real Y chromosome mutational variants. Since the total number of mutations between fathers and sons is already low and is already a rare event, a discovery of even 10 additional mutations via high covering sequencing could have a dramatic impact on the per generation mutational rate and, in this case, the creation evolution debate. Of the two published Y chromosome pedigree based studies, both Xui et al. and Helgeson et al. obtained Y chromosome mutation rates from the low coverage sequence runs, that is, 11 to 20. Uh, times coverage. In addition, whole genome sequencing of mitochondrial DNA in human pedigrees relies on high coverage sequencing runs, and we're talking like 40 times uh, coverage to up to over a thousand times coverage. This contrast immediately suggests an explanation for the discrepancy in pedigree-based mutation rates for mitochondrial DNA versus the Y chromosome, discrepancies in the level of sequence coverage. This hypothesis is testable, so they're going to test it. However, to test this hypothesis, a second aspect of Y chromosome sequence quality must also be considered. Regardless of the level of, of coverage, raw or unfiltered sequencing reads from Y chromosome sequence run, sequ sequencing runs are not useful for pedigree based mutation rate analysis. Compared to autosomes, the Y chromosome has an exceptional amount of sequences class, sequence classes that make sequence read mapping especially challenging for reads derived from next generation or short read sequencing technology. Now one way around this is to do long sequence that would be the perfect way, but unfortunately that is time-consuming and expensive, and, and um, that's, by the way, how we discovered that Y chromosomes in chimps and humans are so different. Um, and so people don't want to do that. They want to do the sh short, cheap ones, but just do a whole lot of them. Palindromic sequences, where they go down one way and come back up the other and the two sides match each other in reverse. Repetitive sequences where you have you know ABC, 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 ABC and sequences that easily map, that is with 99 plus percent identity to the X chromosome, um, which are usually by the way assumed in an evolutionary scenario to have come from the X chromosome because otherwise they couldn't last that long. Um, lead to high levels of ambiguity in the sequence read placement. You can't be sure where it's supposed to fit, so do you know, is this a mutation or not? Um, thus, any study that attempts to analyze the results of Y chromosome sequencing runs must account for this mapping challenge. Historically, several strategies have been employed to circumvent this mapping hurdle. For example, in the Xui et al, pedigree-based mutation rate study, the authors explicitly filtered out difficult-to-map regions of the Y chromosome. So palindromes go, uh, repetitive segments go, and so do things that match the X chromosome very, clo uh, very closely. While they did not provide specific coordinates, they didn't say exactly where they started, but you know, it would have been nice if they did. Um, they reported reducing the useful Y chromosome sequence from a U chromatic size of 24 megabases, that's the standard Y chromosome length, to just 10.15. Now there's a cutoff of over half of it, um, a reduction of over 50%. Conversely, in the Helgeson et al. pedigree based mutation rate study, the authors performed a type of filtration on candidate mutations 
Rather than exclude mutations found in certain types of sequence classes, the author weighed more heavily those mutations found in reliably mapping regions, and they decreased the weight of mutations found in ambiguously mapping regions. Uh, that means they counted them, but only half or a quarter or something like that, uh, with the idea that, that they're not as reliable and so they shouldn't count as much. They just, they tried to do some kind of counting with them. With respect to other types of Y chromosome sequencing studies, such as large scale mapping of the Y chromosome tree, similar filtering strategies have been employed. Some studies, and uh, we're gonna see Y's study come back at us, have focused just on 89.7 megabytes of the X degenerate region. That's the region that looks kind of like the X chromosome, but it's different enough that it's, you can clearly tell uh, that uh, it, uh, it's not on the X chromosome if you have a long enough section. And so you can say, no, that's Y chromosome. Um, now that's degenerative, because it used to be part of the X chromosome and so it's been mutated long enough. That's the standard theory, of course. It raises the question if you were creating something, maybe you wanted something different from the X. Maybe so it won't cross over very much, but whatever. Uh, and, f and free enough of repetitive and palindromic sequences to make straightforward the process of sequence read mapping. So here's, here's a, a section, again, this is one that doesn't have a lot of repeats, doesn't uh, have a lot of uh, palindromes, which are reverse repeats, and doesn't have, and doesn't match the Y, uh, the X very well. It's, it's similar, but it's different enough that you can tell which one you're on. See, because remember, you're taking people who have an X and a Y chromosome, and how do you know that when you, uh, reproduce the uh, genetic material, you're not reproducing X instead of Y. And that's why you try to exclude the ones that, are, that match the X. Other studies have empirically inferred regions of the Y chromosome map that, uh, the Y chromosome that map uniquely, and these results tend to include the X degenerative plus scattered chunks from other sequence classes, so maybe you can include a few others elsewhere, resulting in a total of around 10.3 to 10.45, depending on who's counting, megabytes of callable Y chromosome sequence, similar to the Xui et al. sequence size. In other words, regardless of which way you do it, you come out with very close to the same answer. To date, two high coverage Y chromosome sequencing studies have been published in which pedigree-based mutation rate, right, rate data are available. And Carmen, and we're, we're actually gonna see Moretti et al. coming through as well. Both studies filtered their sequencing data via versions of previously published filters. Moretti et al. published a Y chromosome tree based on the sequence differences found on the X degenerative region of their male participants. That's the good one, or the, the easy to deal with ones. Uh, Carmen et al. utilized a variety of filters, one of which, filter C, was explicitly based on the filters utilized by Y et al. So he said, well, if you use Y's criteria, this is what you got. And Posnick et al., who apparently used the same kind of filters. In this paper, we examine the pedigree-based mutation rates in high-coverage Y chromosome sequencing studies and explore the implications of these results for the Y chromosome molecular clock. Materials and methods, high coverage data sets, and Carmen et al. and Moretti et al. So we'll get to Moretti in a bit. From Carmen et al., we obtained the results of their high coverage sequencing runs on 24 Dutch father-son pairs, six Estonian father-son pairs, and one Estonian brother-brother pair from table S2, column FS, that is father-son. We explored the Carmen et al. 2015 sequence filters that were reported in the text of the supplementary information. Specifically, we focused on filter C, which was based on the previously published filters of Y et al. and Posnick et al. Filter C reduced the mappable Y chromosome sequence to 10.79 megabytes. 
We also focused on the preferred filter of Carmen et al. Filters combination of A plus B plus D. Filter A effectively eliminated regions where the individuals had low coverage. Um, that is, they, they just didn't make as many copies of that one. And um, they wanted to have 40 or over. Filter B effectively eliminated Y chromosome regions that also ma mapped to the X chromosome. So there's that, taking out that one. Neither of these two filters in isolation reduced the callable regions below 12 megabytes. However, filter D alone reduced the callable region to 9.8 megabytes, which you'll notice is even lower than the 10, uh, 10 and a half that people have been using before. Um, this filter is called the remapping filter. And uh, skipping over a few other things, uh, the total that they're, when they applied A plus B plus D, they got down to 8.8 .8 megabytes. Skipping over a few other items there, and those of you who are interested are encouraged to read the original paper and the original paper itself, of course, too. While Moretti et al. 2017 reported a per generation Y chromosome structural variant mutation rate, they did not explicitly report a per generation Y chromosome single nucleotide mutation rate. Oh boy, this, what are you going to do? Well, however, SCOV et al. utilized the Moretti et al. Y chromosome data, and SCOV et al. reported the existence in, in the Moretti et al. data set of 62 males, including 17 father-son pairs, whose Y chromosomes were assembly, assembled to high quality. Yet, like Moretti et al., Skov et al. Failed, also failed to report a per-generation Y chromosome single nucleotide mutation rate. Instead, Skov et al. Re relied on the low coverage results of Helgeson to calibrate their data, and we're trying to get away from low coverage if we can. Nevertheless, Moretti et al. published in Figure 4C in their paper, so even though it wasn't stated in the paper itself, it was uh, in the figure accompanying the paper, a Y chromosome tree consisting of 62 males. Likely the 62 males to which Skov et al. refer. In the extended data on the Y chromosome analysis section, Moretti et al. detailed the construction of the tree. The SNVs, single nucleotide variants, I'm not calling them mutations here, even though they are, um, called using uh, GATK above were used to construct the neighbor, neighbor joining tree. The single nucleotide variants were required to have a filter status of pass, not to be recurrent, and needed to be in the X degenerate region. The neighbor joining tree was constructed using mega six, whatever that is, and using the number of substitutions as the model and pairwise deletion as missing data treatment was run with 500 bootstrap replicates. So they've done a bunch of math on it. And they, they, then, then after they got done with all of that analysis, we calculated 90, this is the, our paper today, we calculated 95% confidence intervals using the T distribution and 95% confidence intervals based on bootstrapped analyses. Uh, low coverage data sets, XU et al. data set, the reported sequencing coverage for each male in the two-person 17 generation pedigree was 11 times and 20 times. We average these values to 15.5 times. Helgeson et al. data set, the author stated the average sequence coverage for the Y chromosome to be 12.4% over the X degenerative regions, which is the regions we're particularly interested in. We tested the abilities of the Carmen et al. 2015 filter C and A plus B plus D, see above, to capture the various weights of these Helgeson et al. mutations in several steps. Did they pick up the mutations? <coughs> Mutation accumulation calculations, we then applied the model specific time of origin. Following Carmen et al., we adopted 250,000 years as the evolutionary time of origin for modern Homo sapiens, which is mitochondrial leave uh, using the old rate. Conversely, for the young uh, Earth creations time scale, we adopted the post flood time scale. That is, we're not going for Adam, we're going for Noah. 
Why is that? Because Noah's three sons had his Y chromosome with whatever mutations they got. And so it should spread from Noah, not just from Adam. And uh, they calculated 2,256 BC as the minimum date for the flood and 2,646 as the maximum date for the flood. They're being a little conservative if you go Septuagint, you might go to, uh, up to about 3,500, but whatever. Uh, we adopted AD 1990 as the maximum to account for the fact that some men may have been young men while others may have been grandfathers. We also used AD 1950 as the minimum stop date. That is, if we assume 1990 as the birth date for the younger men, then 40 years earlier represents the 58-year-old men, a rough surrogate value for the grandparental generation. They're, they're being very explicit, but I want you to notice that 1990 to 1950 is what, 40 years, something like that? And um, uh, over about 3,000 years, it's peanuts. Results, high coverage sequencing increases pedigree-based mutation rate. From the Carmen et al. 2015 and Moretti uh, at all data sets, we extracted per generation pedigree based mutation rates using standard filtering criteria. For the Carmen et al. study, several filter options were supplied, and we chose the filter C since it corresponded to previously published criteria. Consistent with what is already known from comparisons of low coverage and high coverage sequencing runs, for example, given in Poznek et al. in 2016, the two high coverage data sets revealed a per generation mutation rate that was on the average 10 to 17 times faster. And I think I'll see t uh, show you table one in just a bit. Then the previously published, that is Xu or Helgeson uh, low coverage studies. This suggested that the real per generation Y chromosome single nucleotide mutation rate was much higher than previously determined. In fact, it suggested that in the future sequence runs at even higher coverage values might further increase this value. I'm sorry, and there it is. That, that's the table, and you can see that we've gone from a mutation rate of about 3 uh, to 10 to the minus 8 to 3 times 10 to the minus 7th, or maybe even 5 times 10 to the minus 7th, depending on which study you use as your base, which is, you know, 10 to probably 17 or so times as big. Failure of counter explanations. Counter explanations for these results came from only one of the two studies with respect to Moretti et al. and the corresponding study in Skov et al. The authors appeared to possess the raw data indicating a high per generation Y chromosome mutation rate. However, no comment on these rates were made. In contrast, Carmen et al. sees the problem and attempted to explain the unusually high mutation rate that they discovered by employing additional filtration steps to the Y chromosome sequence reads. However, rather than strengthen their counter explanations, their, attempted strength, their attempts strengthened the original implications of their findings. They know this is going in the wrong direction. They're trying to fix it. They're trying to see if you can pick the cherries more carefully, maybe you can get good cherries. Two lines of evidence supported this contention. First, Carmen et al. employed a logically circular argument to explain away the high mutation rate. The Carmen et al. test for false positives was an evolutionary defined low mutation rate. It can't be that high. It just can't because we know. Never mind the data. The number of FS, or that is father son differences, was approximately tenfold higher than the expected number of de novo mutations considering the ra range of published uh, chromosome Y mutation rates. And uh, there's the papers that they're talking about. This finding prompted us to explore additional filters. That's why you get the A plus C plus D inst uh, instead of the just uh, A plus B plus D instead of the just using C. They're trying to pick the cherries a slightly different way, seeing if maybe we can get this to come out right. 
Second, independent test of the specificity and sensitivity of the Carmen et al. Uh, extra filtration steps revealed a slight gain in specificity at the expense of a large loss in sensitivity. What does that mean, a large loss of sensitivity? It means you don't pick up all the mutations. Aside from their circular attempts to reduce the father-son mutation rate to a value in line with what the evolutionary expectations defined, the authors provided no checks and balances on their method. Hey, if it gives us the right answer, we're not going to ask questions. Skipping over high coverage mutation rate explains why chromosome differences in 4,500 years, which is the bottom line for um, Jensen et al. Um, we found that mutation rates from the high coverage studies explained the branch lengths of the Y chromosome tree to within just a few thousand years. We also found that these rates rejected the evolutionary time of origin for the first modern Homo sapiens. Okay, so now you're going to see what happens if you do R. Um, and we're getting to figure three just a minute. Um, for simplicity, when measuring the total branch lengths, we began by simply adopting the typical evolutionary root position. Conversely, based on the results of the accompanying paper, we also explored, uh, which is a whole different subject in and of itself, we also explored an alternative, better supported root position. And we found that the high coverage Y chromosome mutation rate explained all but the most divergent haplotype A branch lengths in about 4,500 years. Uh, and there's the, this is the predicted young Earth creationist time scale. Okay. How many mutations should you expect? This is the actual, if you assume that an evolutionary route, and we're going to see if you assume different routes where that fits in the scale in two slides. Here's what it looks like if you compare it with the evolutionary Ex uh, rate. This is the rate that is required for evolution to be correct. As you can see, it's down below, well below the 95% confidence limits. It's not impossible, but it certainly isn't what you expect. Uh, and here you can see the width of the mutations that might be predicted, all the way from what, 20, 15, 20,000 to 90,000. But you see, the actual number was back there again. The actual number was about 1,600. Now, what happens if you root them differently? You get different rates, and you can see that if you root it in uh, uh, haplotypes, uh, haplogroups F to T, C to E, you can see these are in the lower range of the predicted young Earth creationists. This is the up, um, lower middle about right on the money here, on the higher range. And this one is out of the range, but not as badly as, um, as the evolutionary time scale is out of the range. Finally, these results made indirect predictions about the relationship between the history of civilization and the structure of the Y chromosome tree. Since phylogenetic trees record changes in population size, for example, see Carmen, the current Y chromosome tree must have also recorded changes in past human population size. When people multiply, suddenly uh, you get a vast expansion of the genetic material. However, since our results implied that the entire tree was only a few thousand years old, our results predicted that known recent, that is within the last two, few thousand years, changes in population size would be stamped throughout the tree in a manner consistent with the recent origin of the tree. In other words, the deeper roots of the Y chromosome tree should record not changes in population size from 200,000 years ago, but changes in population size from the recent past. And there again, there's a more in-depth treatment of that in the other Jensen paper. Discussion, a 4,500-year-old Y chromosome molecular clock. Our results demonstrate that a Y chromosome molecular clock exists and it specific, specifies about 4,500, well, to be honest, more like three to eight or something like that, uh, in total for human, human paternal history. Rather than being an anomaly, 
These results fall in line with the expectations derived from, com from comparisons of low coverage and high coverage Y chromosome sequences. If you do the work more carefully, you get a better answer. Since high coverage sequencing is known to increase the T-tip length over the lengths derived from low coverage sequencing, and since father-son relationships among the living represent the most terminal aspects of any tree, at least to, to present, until we have future kids, our empirical results match precisely what previous results had predicted. Conversely, our results also strongly challenge the evolutionary time scale, which we saw the figure. Rather than confirm a history for humanity that stretches back hundreds of thousands of years, these results reject this hypothesis. If men had been around for hundreds of thousands of years, they should have accumulated mutations 8 to 59 times the amount currently observed. Instead, uh, 8 to 60, you know, we're not being that accurate. Instead, we observe only a few thousand years worth of mutation accumulation. Furthermore, the combined results from mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosomes in, in this paper analysis represent two independent lines of evidence, maternal ancestry and paternal ancestry, that reject the evolutionary time scale for the origin of humans, or at least require a severe bottleneck. Together, these two data sets falsify the current evolutionary model for humanity. How might the evolutionary model adapt to these contrary data? With respect to pedigree-based analysis, evolutionists might re invoke natural selection, a me mechanism by which a high mutation rate could be converted to a lower substitution rate because you eliminate most of the mutations. Alternatively, evolutionists might hypothesize that the mutation rate has recently sped up, that it was much slower in times past. Okay. Either way, for these hypotheses to be scientific, they must make testable predictions. For example, can any of these evolutionary hypotheses predict the pedigree-based mutation rate for A00 individuals, or African individuals in general, since they haven't tested those yet? Be interesting to see, does it fit? Um, and uh, same with uh, Moretti, uh, Carmen et al, Moretti, uh, all dead Europeans. Or Asian individuals or Native American individuals, none of which were part of the same father-son pedigree study. So there's more work that can be done, and it'll be interesting to see who comes out closer to accurate. Unless the evolutionary hypotheses can meet this standard, that is, the standard to which evolutionists have held creationists for many years, you know, it can explain anything. Um, then these hypotheses cannot be considered scientific. If you can explain anything uh, by, by variables that are uh, completely tunable, uh, then your, your hypothesis does not become scientific because it won't eliminate anything. And that means it can't be useful. Um, other ways to rescue the evolutionary model, one finding reported in Carmen et al. 2015 could give pause to the conclusion reached in this paper. So maybe there's a small problem. In the supplemental text, Carmen et al. report that they validated with Sanger sequencing SNP, single nuclear uh, I'm not sure what P, it should be SNV usually, or SNM. Uh, oh no, it is, it's poly uh, single nucleotide but it, it means the same thing. Between three fathers and their six sons and between two brothers in one case where the father's genome failed quality control. So they, they were going to do a father and two brothers, but the father it didn't work, so they just did the two brothers. We compared altogether seven pairs from four Estonian families. At first, we applied um, VQ high, 95% Colray custom filter combination. That's our friendly A plus B plus D and excluded all individual ends from, uh, from comparisons. This filtering sequence revealed within these seven pairs in, in total six differences. All these occurred within two families and in four unique positions. In other words, these false positives might imply that the high mutation rate under the filter C was an artifact, not a real region. So they're saying, well, maybe it isn't as big as we thought. However, in this one particular example, 
The authors have once again failed to specify questions of sensitivity and specificity. Remember, if you miss a bunch of mutations, you're going to think it's low. A father-son mutation rate of 0.62 mutations per generation uh, is what they finally got, but their Sanger, Sanger sequencing results implied that in father-son pairs that they examined, mutation rate was less than one mutation every seven generations, which is too long for even evolutionary expectations. So um, at that point, you're going, well, maybe they're twisting the data. You know, when you start picking pineapples off the tree, you know something is wrong. Um, <clears throat> The results would have been too stringent even for the ancient evolutionary time scales. Extrapolated to the rest of the father-son pairs, the Sanger sequencing results implied that all father-son differences were false positives, which could, would produce a mutation rate less than one mutation every 31 generations. That's not happening. Ten times lower than the expectations based on a model which puts the first male ancestor about 250,000 years ago. Skipping over, conversely, one other reason for pause stems from the method methodologies we employed with the Moretti et al. data. Since our mutation rate was derived from inferring branch lengths from their published tree, it would be important to confirm these results with the raw, that is, pairwise alignment-based rather than phylogenetic tree-based, Y-chromosome sequences from the father-son pairs. We anticipate little deviation from the results we described here. So that would be interesting to go through and see whether it actually matches, you know, exactly, rather than just from trees. Conclusion, the, together the results in this paper and in the accompanying paper present a compelling case, well, at least a persuasive case, I would say, for the origin of the most recent globally common human male ancestor within the last 4,500 years. Combined with the previously published results from mitochondrial DNA, which is summarized in Jensen in 2016, but which we've been over in this class before, our data also make the young earth creationism origin of the most recent common male and female ancestors a difficult conclusion to refute. Well, at least in that range. Now, my take on all this. Doing Y chromosome analysis is complicated because of all of those other things that we talked about. If one is obtaining raw data, it is expensive. You can do the shotgun stuff, but then you're limited to certain parts of the chromosome. Um, if one is reanalyzing the data, it is laden with assumptions. You think you know what they're doing, but you, don't, you didn't actually do it. However, the data that were obtained suggest a short time frame for the last common male ancestor, that is, what's commonly known as Y chromosome Adam, and from our perspective would actually be Y chromosome Noah. From a short age perspective, this is comforting. From a long age perspective, this is surprising. And you can tell how surprising because they fight against it. Combined with the human mitochondrial data, this makes a good argument for the recent origin of humanity, which would be in line with the biblical record. Combined with the mitochondrial barcode data, it suggests that not just humanity, but all species are recent, which is really comforting if you're in, uh, looking at it from a biblical perspective. Now, I don't think we're done. I think there are other things that can still be done. One of them would be to go back to the raw data, as Jensen mentioned. Um, I don't know whether we'll have access to that or not. And of course, the person who does should know enough about the raw data to know what they're looking at. Um, but some things that could be done, for one thing, do other species, or perhaps kinds, of vertebrates give similar trees? I'd love to see the dog tree. Dogs, wolves, coyotes, dingoes. Because the direct implications of the Noah's flood story is that all dogs should descend from a single pair. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether that actually works. Um, and whether the same thing is true of cats, or maybe there are two kinds of cats. There's lion tigers and there's others. I don't know. Uh, or maybe there's five kinds of cats and you'll be, you'll be able to say there's lion tigers, there's cheetahs, and then there's house cat type cats. Um, we should be able to make those determinations. 
Uh, furthermore, are partial trees consistent with short age or long age conclusions? I'm talking about partial uh, human trees. Uh, for example, the Cohens. Uh, it's well known now that all Cohens are descended from one male ancestor. And for those of you who don't know, Cohen is the Hebrew name for priest. And so it appears that priestly code, uh, that all the priests, when they took a last name, they call themselves the priest. Cohen, Cohen, there's a number of different variations. Um, I don't know whether Kuhn is close enough or not, K-U-H-N. It would be interesting to see um, how far back would those go? Because by history, they should go back to Aaron, which is, depending on whose theory you're believing, somewhere between 1200 and 1400 BC. I tend to like the 1400 BC better, uh, maybe 1500 BC. Um, and that c you could use to calibrate how fast everything spreads. And if it matches 4,500 years for everybody, then you have another confirmation. If it doesn't match, uh, then you don't have a confirmation. And then you have to uh, you know, start asking other questions about whether we've got, whether we either don't understand it or else that, uh, or else that there's, uh, maybe it's longer than anybody thought. I hope not shorter than anybody thought because I don't see how you can get uh, human history in less than 4,300 4, years as a minimum. Um, then of course there's the Iceman. The Iceman should have fewer changes from the original, whatever that was. And maybe if we can establish what the original was, and we can establish where Iceman was, we can say, it, does, does that match what we expect uh, in terms of genetic variation? Um, Neanderthals. It would be interesting to see where they fit in terms of their Y chromosome. Because most creationists feel that Neanderthals are, in fact, human. And then, of course, the other thing that's interesting is historical migration date. Uh, now, immediately you get into debates as to when do the, uh, for example, the American Indians come across the bridge, or the Native Americans, whatever you want to call them, you know. Uh, 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 or maybe some of them sailed from someplace else, I don't know. But, um, uh, but we might be able to find communities that came over and have records that go back, let's say, seven generations and everybody's descended from one male ancestor. And then we might be able to use that as a, as a database to try to determine the mutation rate from well agreed by everybody historical dates. Um, I think we need to do our own research. I think if we don't do that, we wind up with filtered data. And I think when we do our research, we need to be very careful about it and do it extremely well. Learn from the mistakes of others. This is going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy, but it can be done if you do it right. But the rewards, if you do it right, may well be worth it. And in any case, we will be doing science. And if we present it appropriately, I think that this is the kind of thing that could be publishable. And, um, but that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Ariel, you're, and then we have a comment up here, I think. Well, um, uh, I thought I saw a hand. Maybe not. Okay. Ariel, go ahead. Well, uh, uh, this is complicated, of course, and uh, I followed most of it. Uh, but uh, uh, to me, one of the most significant things here is the uh, broader implication of these rates. I uh, come back to how can the human race have survived so long? And this, I mean, uh, this adds to that, to that f factor that, you know, uh, 
we're degenerating at a tremendous rate. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we need, need to look any further than beyond society to uh, find some confirmation of that. Uh, so it, it, our, our idea is that uh, we're progressing and evolving are very much challenged by these mutation rates. I mean, they're incredible. They are much faster than anybody anticipated. Uh, and in fact, it's interesting to note that that same problem guarantees that we can't keep the genetic information we have. I mean, I suppose we can keep it within a certain range to, uh, you know, because we're not all dead right now, but uh, but if you try to put it into the standard geologic time scale, um, it makes it difficult. And uh, either maybe God keeps renewing it, which I'm not sure that's where they want to go, <laughs> or we haven't been there that long. And you know, if you don't have that much time, then you can't get evolution to work. You just can't. And in fact, this stuff is starting to look like it's pointing towards, uh, again, not an exactly biblical, but it's certainly a generally biblical frame of reference. A frame of reference is compatible with standard biblical theory. One little question. Uh, uh, they bypass the population issue a little bit. Uh, and I uh, agree, but I would, I, why does population affect this since you're going from uh, one generation down to the next one, regardless of uh, population size, it's generation numbers that count. Yes, yes. And in fact, if a, a father can sire multiple sons, why well, they can get reserved very close to the same DNA, uh, certainly Y chromosome. Uh, on the other hand, if you have to do father to son to son to son to son and so forth, then you really have to, uh, you have to have really good uh, preservation things. It looks like, according to these people, that there's what, 23 or something like that changes per Y chromosome. Um, that's a lot of changes. And if something is really, really well built, it may take a long time before you eat through the, the veneer enough to make it, you know, uh, non-serviceable anymore, so to speak. But... Um, that's it, why we're still here. That's why we're still here, is because it hasn't been that long. And that raises some interesting questions that the X transposed, maybe isn't X transposed, maybe the Y chromosome was created with those to match the X chromosome to begin with. That we needed two copies of some particular uh, genetic material, not just one. Of course, the, the girls don't have any problem with that, but A comment over here. Yes, Jack. Um, just one question. Uh, is anyone looking for a connection between the proposed great ape ancestors of humans and the Y chromosome and what's in the human Y chromosome? Yes, actually, we had a talk on that. Uh, maybe it'd be interesting to revisit that sometime um, because uh, there's been enough new material that we could put out a, uh, shall we say, an updated version of it that might be uh, useful for reference purposes. Uh, it is absolutely striking. Uh, that is to say, The human and chimpanzee Y chromosome, each one has 30% of absolutely brand new material that the other 
does not, which is just amazing. Nobody expected that. Furthermore, the pieces that do match are completely reorganized. Um, I almost threw that in at the end, but I thought, you know what? I mean, it's 11.40 now, so we're, we've stretched it as it is. Um, that there's a quote that says that the DNA for humans um, matches, uh, uh, has as many differences from chimpanzee DNA uh, in Y chromosome as do autosomes from humans have differences with chickens, <laughs> which is 310 million years. Okay. And, you know, that's 6 million years to 310? No. Something is wrong with this picture. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if humans are that close together, and there's another, um, another study that says that the human Y chromosome varies way less than human autosomes do, and even significantly less than uh, human uh, X chromosomes or even mitochondria do. And you put that, you know, it sounds like Y chromosomes don't vary much at all. And yet you're putting this into a uh, uh, something where the human Y chromosome and the chimpanzee Y chromosome are just totally uh, unmatching to each other. Uh, you'll have to, uh, um, after class, maybe I'll show you a picture that will just rivet it in your mind. And, uh, and maybe it's time to bring that one back because sometimes it's a good idea to re, uh, re-look at some of these things that we've looked at years ago. Uh, but it is, it is absolutely striking. I will gladly take a rain check on that conversation. I, I need to run right now. Okay, well, um, I'll get to you then, later. Uh, comment here. Um, you mentioned um, ICR, of course, and then Ken Hams. Is there anyone else doing any studies on recent? Uh, the the major three groups in the world, besides the Adventist Church itself, of course, is um, is Answers in Genesis. That's Ken Ham. Right and uh, Institute for Creation Research, and uh, Creation Ministries International. So what I'm asking, the rest of the world, scientific world, really does not want to look at it? Well, I mean, you have people like uh, uh, Reine Kainen in Finland, for example. But he's one man. He doesn't have an organization. And he's basically friendly with everybody. Um, and in fact, I think where you don't have organizations, the, the friendliness tended to increase. But I, I think one of the things that I've noticed is that the creationist organizations, the big three, have become much more cooperative as time has gone on. Which is excellent. However, maybe no one else is interested in it because it does not quite fit their paradigm. So they're going to lose the... Uh, grants and all the money and government support. Well, the, what's happened is that people who become creationists start looking around for other creationists and they run into them and they kind of gravitate towards one or the other of the big three. Um, uh, there, there is the organization, the Creationist uh, uh, Creation Research Society. Um, but that one was kind of has drawn from all different groups, and and uh, 
has not had a lot of bureaucratic involvement in anything. They don't have a website. I don't think they have a website that does, uh, does uh, uh, creation outreach to uh, high schools or colleges or churches or, or stuff like that. Uh, they're really more of a research group, and maybe that's part of it, is that more research you do, the, the more you realize that you need other researchers. <laughs> but, um, uh, and, and, and maybe that's a sign that uh, creation societies are becoming more research-oriented, and which is helping them. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's a little difficult to, to uh, try to figure out exactly how that works. Uh, for one thing, um, these people are too busy to be terribly reflective, uh, for which I don't blame them, you know. I mean, they have, they have priorities and one of them is not chronicling what they do. That's a little bit of a navel-gazing exercise in a way. Um, but, you know, when you see it from kind of a slight outsider's perspective, um, it's kind of nice to watch people starting to work together. And uh, I think that the more of this we see, the better off we are. Um, when we look at, uh, it's in Daniel, it says, in the last days, knowledge shall be increased. And we, <laughs> and we all know this. Um, however, we see this tremendous uh, degeneration of uh, how do you reconcile this? Well, you think about it. Fifty years ago, well, to be precise, seventy years ago, nobody had heard of DNA as a information carrying uh, molecule. The idea that you could uh, take bases and align them and say, and this means that, and this means that, and this means that, and this whole thing, it's arranged so that we start at this end and here's where we start the protein. I mean, that's just, that whole thing has grown up in the last 70 years. You know, and then it was painful to get the first few. People discovered phenylalanine by stringing polyuridine together and noticing that, that it put out proteins that, that uh, or peptides that had phenylalanine drawn to each other. And they said, oh, well, the code for phenylalanine must be UUU. I mean, that's how, that's how crude it started out. And, you know, that was probably 50 years ago. And very expensive also to do. And very expensive. <laughs> and nowadays, yeah, you know, if you you want a mitochondrial barcode and yeah. you know, fifteen bucks, and you can get it. It's just crazy, and that's fifteen bucks of today's money, not right. of the, you know, money back money. then. Um, it's, it is totally amazing what has happened in, in, and the thing of it is, I think some of this stuff is probably sitting near the surface some of which you will have to dig for because they, they don't want to dig in the right place. Um, and some of which we can actually pull out of their own database, which is what Jensen has done here. Um, I, I, think that we should, I think that we should go beyond what they say and start doing this kind of thing on, for example, dogs. Because if you can start showing that this animal and that animal and the other animal, and all bears, for example, go back to one pair of bears, or two, but whatever it turns out to be, and you start saying there's an original kind here, there's an original kind here, there's an original kind here, and we can do it by the Y chromosomes, all of a sudden, we have a predictive process that, uh, you know, what would be interesting is eventually to, to try to find out whether, for example, elephants and uh, mammoths were all the same kind. Mm -hmm. 
And maybe elephants were all the hairless ones, and so they lived better in the tropics, and so they moved down there. Uh, the possibilities are uh, practically unlimited, and we've only begun to scratch the surface. And I, I mean, if there's any one thing I would want to say besides creationists do not need to hang their heads in shame, if anything, the other people are having a harder time explaining stuff, is right now the sky is the limit. And there is no reason for a Christian not to want to be a researcher and find out how this stuff works. And if you do it the right way, you probably can get the right answers. Yeah. And the right way can be defined outside of what gives the right answers. Well, when the good book says, after its kind, mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. tremendous bearing. We could start answering the question, what is its kind? Yeah. Do foxes belong with, with wolves, for example? Mm. Check it out. Thank you. Anyway. We'll have something for you next week. I have a little more time, so I'll probably be able to do more. And maybe, if I'm lucky, we'll get to germs.